But check this out. It says, in sin did my mother conceive me. Right? In debt did my mother conceive me. You know how the saying goes, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Okay, so the tree is a debt tree. Then the fruit is going to be dead also. So therefore, the fruit that's coming from this tree is a fruit of debt. Your mom was in debt when you were born. So therefore, you are a debt instrument. You are a product of a debtor. Just like if your mother's a U.S. citizen, that automatically makes you a U.S. citizen at birth. Now it's the Christian's belief that Jesus died for their sins 2,000 years ago before the person or the man or woman even existed. And so what sins did you have 2,000 years ago? You know, some type of moral sin that you committed 2,000 years ago or better that Jesus came along and died for prior to your even existence. I mean, that doesn't make very much sense. The fact of the matter is, is that a system was put in place for you to uh, sacrifice your property or your relationship with this piece of property that you might want to call it Jesus. You make a sacrifice of this property and in turn for your sacrifice, you receive a particular exemption whereby your debt is paid. That's the fact of the matter. As a first lady and as a woman, like, you are beautiful. Yeah. You yeah. are the bomb. Right. Don't be waiting that long. Don't <laughs> let no man. I mean, she's just trying to get you married. <laughs> because you are amazing and you have so that's much true. to offer. And I just have to now say, here, that's kind Loretta of I is a attractive with, woman. Might, you know, and so be a if curious the bishop nosy, you know, that's just is that's sexually and that's fine. I attracted like to her, a great place. then I she really is probably I already married to the bishop. Genuine, and I'm going to show you my point. point. I felt Check that it was out. an overkill. Now, here in Genesis yeah, you can be 16, verses 1 through 4, where it reads, Now Sarah, Abram's wife, say, this is her life. bare him this no children, and, and she had a handmaid. An Egyptian, and Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And, he can judge them, and Sarah said and unto Abram, Behold so now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened unto the voice of Sarah. And Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So as this story goes, Sarai couldn't bear children, so she had a handmaiden and her name was Hagar. So she gave Hagar to Abram, her husband, to be his wife. So I'm not seeing no preacher in here nowhere. And when Abram went in on to Hagar and she conceived, then they bore children. And this was the will of God because this is what was expressed by Sarah. So as far as it being fornication and adultery and all the rest of that, it's just plain ridiculous because Abram lived up to his responsibilities as a husband to Hagar. And what gives you the impression that I'm waiting? I'm living my well, life. What are you doing? What's going I, on? I tell you what I'm doing. I tell you exactly <laughs> what we're doing. I'm living my life. He's a part of my life. I'm a part of his life. He loves me. I love him. There is something about this that I personally like, something that I feel like could be said to other young women not to be sitting around, I guess, yes. 
waiting because mm -hmm. we are kind of taught okay. traditionally Michelle you are to go to school, get go to high school, go to college, get your degree. The women, then so after that, marriage. Traditionally, right. women are taught to go to school, get a degree. Then after that, marriage. But she failed to mention anything about supporting themselves. So apparently, the marriage is supposed to support the woman, and this is what they're taught traditionally. So I'm trying to figure out whose tradition is it? Whose tradition is it to go to school, get a degree, and then get married? Is it Moore's tradition? Is it human tradition? Is it uh, Phoenician uh, tradition? Is it Pharisee tradition? Whose tr tradition is it? And I believe, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, I believe it is the European tradition to do those things. Go to school, get a degree, get married, and let a man take care of you for the rest of your life. But let's check into that. Marriage, according to Black's Law Dictionary, is a contract according to the form prescribed by law by which a man and a woman capable of entering into such a contract mutually engage with each other to live their whole lives or until divorced together in a state of union which ought to exist between a husband and wife. So question always enters my mind when one starts talking about the law then whose law are we talking about? Are we talking about God's law or are we talking about some form of man's law? Let's check into that further. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 17 it says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God, she said, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. There's an important point to be made here. It says, God, she said, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel. Okay, this says that God said, or God had appointed Eve another seed instead of Abel. So where's all this talk coming from that the seed comes from the man? It appears that the seed was appointed to the woman by God and it did not come from the man. In other words, the seed came from the woman. So the question should be, who was around at this particular point? What preacher was around to uh, right give now? vows to it, it Adam and Eve? Been. Mm -hmm. it came with the of course, of this was sanctioned I by God because they said parents, God appointed me a son, it, right? So who was around, what preacher was around and, and you, that you're, gave you're the vows right? to Adam and Eve to there, make this particular there. union so, holy, whereby the, the offsprings of this union not was not illegitimate. Of course, God gave the children to Adam and Eve, so therefore the, the children had to be legitimate because this whole thing is about God. So if God sanctioned it, then who can say nay? I'll tell you who can say nay, it's the state. The state is the naysayers. They're the ones that have the judges and the preachers and so forth say nay that you can't have a union, a marriage, without a preacher being involved or a judge. That's who's saying nay by way of contract. And why wasn't it fornication if, if a preacher wasn't involved? I'll tell you why. Because a preacher ain't necessary for a man and a woman to marry. This definition is also taken from Black's Law Dictionary, the fourth edition. It says fornication, unlawful sexual, unlawful sexual intercourse between two unmarried persons. Okay, I'm not going to go into the definition of all these particular intricates here, but... The point is well made that it's unlawful. Now, whose law are we talking about? Since we're talking about blacks' law, we're talking about man's law. So we're talking about marriage in the form that's commonly known to most is a contract. And this contract is between the man, the woman, 
and the state. It's not solely between the man and the woman because if that's the case, then why do they need the state? If you pay attention, then the state will come in and they'll decide what happens to your offspring, in other words, the children that come from the marriage, if y'all have some type of dispute or whatever the case may be. They intervene in your affairs because you've given them permission to do so by entering into a contract with them through the marriage license and then taking a vow before their minister that you may call very well call your minister or your preacher. He's actually acting on behalf of the state, whatever state that may be.